This is Pointless Witticisms, the thing where I talk about things, where every given thing is a film that I think will likely have no lasting impact on you, uh, beyond, like, spectacle and a bit of entertainment for the afternoon. Uh, for the most part, it also covers deep and meaningful things that will likely be forgotten or that had little impact when they came out. Really, it's just about things in general. Uh, today's thing is The Immortals, a film just about good enough to be bad. Uh, whereas uh, Clash of the Titans was camp, The Immortals is like Clash of the Titans meets 300. It's cool and badass and Utterly, utterly camp, with a lot of shirtless men beating each other up. In The Immortals, an evil human warlord is out to free the... the uh, well, go and free the Titans by obtaining an epic super bow or whatever that um, will enable him to destroy things that the gods are protecting, that the gods could totally protect themselves if they just, you know, uh, smited him or whatever. But um, it's... They're in this big, giant CGI war that's depicted in so weird a manner you swear that it would be the lead-up for a vaguely Greek-inspired rap song by Kanye West or something, or possibly another commercial for Ferrero Rocher. That's the chocolates that are very glamorously marketed to people, but ones that you can buy at a pound store anyway. In The Immortals, there is a Minotaur, which is a big spooky man in a bullhead mask, there is a big old fight with a man smiting an entire army of soldiers with some godly powers from this spooky magical bow. But really the whole thing feels at once both original and new, and yet not necessary and kind of old and dated and something you'll have seen before. Immortals is about a Greek hero whose legend is so far removed from the Greek myth as to make calling it a Greek myth film a wee bit inaccurate since it is about Theseus who becomes a hero that joins the gods in the same way that Hercules did, except he's the son of Zeus, which off the top of my head is a thing that was um, Perseus's thing. And uh, to throw it all together with the trifecta of silly stuff, he of course slays the Minotaur. So Theseus in this film is Theseus, Hercules, and Perseus, all wrapped up in one character, fighting against a vaguely Greek-looking guy whose legend is completely untold, called Hyperion, which is a funny name for a person trying to free the Titans to be called, considering that Hyperion in Greek myth was a Titan. Uh, that's not to say that I dislike Hyperion as a villain. He is, in fact, one of the most uh, interesting parts of this film, actually, since he's got this whole, like, grudge against the gods, angry atheist thing going on. Well, not angry atheist, because, of course, he believes that the gods exist. He just wants to destroy the gods. So, more of an anti-theist than an atheist. Now, the uh, Greek gods are, of course, in this film, as they would be in any Greek myth film, and surprisingly, they are mostly here to help a 20-something white man fight an evil guy that actually looks a bit kind of Greekish, and to stand around shirtless a lot wearing silly hats. This is, of course, accurate to most depictions of the Greek gods, though quite a few seem to be lacking beards for a portion of the film. It's weird having everyone in a Greek film be so clean-shaven everywhere. At least 300 gave people beards for the most part. There's nothing wrong with being clean-shaven over your body, it's just weird when everyone is like that and perfectly shaven in a pre-Gillette era of man and womankind. It fits the art style though, which is um, something that I'll be getting onto in a moment. You see, the colour palette of the film is the same ugly brown and skin tone mix of anyone who just started playing Warhammer and is mere seconds away from realising why everybody just ends up using primary colours anyway instead of realistic ones. You can paint everything shades of metal if you like, and brown and khakis and stuff. It's just Nobody can see a damned thing on the model, and uh, you can't even really see much of what you did. And, yeah, colour tends to be fun to look at. The Greek gods in this film are pretty to look at at times, when they're actually wearing gold instead of brown, or shades of white. And the Greek titans in this film are a bit of a shake-up, because they are grey, a dull, 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 dull grey with a bit of bronze on their hats instead of being brown, and this makes it very easy to tell the gods from the titans, and very hard to tell the titans from the rocks in the background. 
Uh, my mild disgust at the film's visual style has of course been slightly undone by a cursory Wikipedia search, where it is mentioned that the goal of the film was to make a film that looked like a Renaissance painting, and it succeeded spectacularly in that regard, and I can now look back fondly on a number of dumb-looking fights and understand that most, if not every frame, would not look out of place hung in a museum somewhere in Britain. Indeed, most of the open-mouthed screaming is perfectly in fitting with what is to be expected in the brown sky skies, brown dirt, and odd bit of white toga here and there. This film certainly has a style, and that style is to be as appreciated as the style of 300, which was also a very stylistic film, and also a bit of a dumb one. Now, the film's designated love interest here is a virgin, in the same vein as that one from The Scorpion King, except uh, this prophecy-granting virgin hates her powers of prophecy and needs to get them fucked out of her, whereas the one in The Scorpion King was just fucking around with everyone and her powers of prophecy were completely unconnected to her being a virgin, and she just used that as a sneaky uh, way so that nobody would try and fuck around with her. And it let her bed Dwayne The Rock Johnson's character at the end of the film with a rather cheesy line. Now, The Scorpion King, starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson, was a prequel to the ridiculous but enjoyable Brendan Frazier mummy films, and it's exactly the sort of run-of-the-mill action film that you'd accuse immortals of being, except that where The Scorpion King is run-of-the-mill action, ticks most about every box, and is kind of, you know, enjoyable but dumb, the immortals ticks whatever box it wants to be. It's art, it doesn't need to be fun, it can make the shots as nice and pretty as it wants, and I admire the Immortals for that, even as I find the visuals a bit ugly and the story uglier. This film was made to look pretty in a certain way. It's a painting in motion, it's just one of those paintings that sometimes you're going to probably pass over when you're looking around in the gallery, because the oil tones make it kind of hard to distinguish detail without a lot of, like, subtle, slow study, but this is not a film where you can do that sort of slow, careful study when the action is, of course, being thrown around and smashing everything. Now, the uh, final talking point I'm going to be doing is, of course, Mickey Rourke, who plays the villain in this film. This is important because Mickey Rourke is the most driven character in this film, and that's a bit of a problem when he is, of course, the antagonist, and he's going around with his hatred of the gods, and that's an aspect of this film that I liked the most, because that's the sort of thing that you'd expect from the villain of a film about uh, the gods and this Twilight War or whatever. And good job on Mickey Rourke for looking threatening while dressed up as a rabbit. The helmet that he wears in this film is more than a little bit silly when you look at it in pictures, but like... I liked it. It's got all these teeth, it's pointy, it's sharp, it's closing in on his face. And a lot of the costumes in this film look silly, but are also really fitting and have this artistic style to them. I just wish there was a way to discern that with having to look back at screenshots, because when I was watching the film, I didn't appreciate them and I thought it looked silly, but when I stop and I look at it as a painting or as a still image, it looks really cool. I would, of course, rank this as a very good Greek myth-inspired film, because it's just inspired by it. It's not necessarily telling the same story that we've already heard. Uh, Clash of the Titans has the problem of being basically tied to an existing Clash of the Titans film, and Immortals has the advantage of being able to be its own thing, but Clash of the Titans has a lot of colours, and has this jumbled art style where it keeps going about and doing different things, whereas Immortals has its palette and has its style that is consistent throughout the film. It has hordes of grey people for monsters. It has epic gods against everyone battles that form a tapestry in the heavens or whatever in the end, and that is something that is very impressive to do, but... When you compare it to Clash of the Titans, Clash of the Titans has a fight against Medusa. So, yeah. Kudos to Immortals for having a very good art style and a sort of auteur directive behind it. It is its own project and it has a wonderful idea. But as an execution, I dare say that um, it's just a film that I watched. And I had to go out and read up on stuff to see the merit behind it. 9 minutes and 47 seconds.